but thank you very much, uh, Johan, for uh, that uh, introduction. Let me first take the opportunity to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, conference for inviting me to engage. I'm particularly pleased at the chance I've had to engage with uh, my colleagues, but also very refreshingly uh, the opportunity to engage with the, the future scientists, the, 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 the young scientists who are being trained here, the young men and women, because with them holds the, we, they hold the future for um, uh, science at the frontiers of uh, this whole conversation we have this week around sustainable development goals. So it was, it's a pleasure and I thank you very much. Um, and I, I really uh, felt a wonderful opportunity when I got this invitation uh, to be here uh, to speak at this conference because uh, I was just coming from uh, Indonesia where um, colleagues of the World Agroforestry Center, once a year, every year, we meet for about three or four days to really take stock uh, of the science, of the research of agroforestry and its continuing relevance in the world in terms of uh, solving problems. And uh, this week, this last week, the, the, the topic of the science week for for the World Agroforestry Center was exactly resonating with the thrust of this conference, which is looking at the role of science against the standpoint, the context of um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. So it was really a timely moment and opportunity to take forward, to revisit some of the key discussions that were held at that uh, conference last week. I, I think for me, what this shows is really the relevance of, uh, it's a timely and pertinent time, uh, topic, a time to discuss uh, 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 science's continuing relevance in this whole uh, uh, move towards our sustainable uh, development goals. It suddenly helps us to interrogate our science in terms of, is it still uh, what is needed? Is there more to be done? Is it a different kind of science? So it's timely and it's relevant. And I think it's, it's, it's a great chance that um, the, the organizers took this topic, uh, uh, used this as a topic for their conference. Um, the FAO just released, just to be sure that we set the context, um, the FAO has released its usual, its annual SOFA study, State of Food and Agriculture. Uh, in spite of the, the kind of uh, slightly pessimistic title of that, uh, uh, of that uh, uh, State of Food and Agriculture for 2015, the state of food insecurity in the world, it really does have some very optimistic messages and I think it's good to kind of foreground our discussion on science on this optimistic note. Uh, among its key messages were three that stood out. One, that global hunger has continued to decline, albeit gradually um, uh, to an estimated 795 million undernourished people or a reduction of about 167 million hungry people over the last 10 years. That's a very optimistic uh, uh, um, uh, statistic out there. Then this decline has been most pronounced in developing countries despite significant population growth. 72 developing countries have reached the 2015 Millennium Development uh, target of having the proportion of hungry people uh, 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 reduced, uh, have, uh, being halved. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a moment to celebrate. But I would argue that our progress continues to be slow and progress continues to be unbalanced uh, between countries, even within countries, between ethnic groups, between men and women. So there's still uh, there's clearly um, uh, uh, remaining uh, fundamental challenges beyond just food quantity and caloric intake, um, uh, I think. Um, tomorrow, the United Nations will be gathering, as we all know, to launch the, the, the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. 17 goals, the last one being the means of implementation, very multifaceted goals, as we can see. It's all about, you know, not just food security, but incomes and a whole range of other mutually uh, influencing and interlinked uh, goals. Um, what, uh, and and I, I just want to quickly share with you what I, the, the, the overarching objectives of these um, uh, sustainable development goals. It is ultimately about delivering improved human well-being while sustaining environmental services. The two ends inside are improved human well-being, environmental sciences. It is not directly related 
to the science, but we all understand, but it's science that drives change. So it's very important to interrogate what are the kinds of, what's the kind of science that's going to be positioned optimally to allow the accomplishment of these hugely important uh, social goals. It's about equitable economic development. It's about prioritizing, satisfying essential needs of the world's population, the world's poorest. It is about climate resilient pathways. We have had quite a bit of conversation around climate smart agriculture, and we'll take that conversation forward, hopefully in the panel. It is about uh, also taking care to address the limitations imposed on the environment and the ability um, to meet the present and future needs of, of the world. So ultimately, when we look at these goals, it's really about equity. It's, it's about what are the, the functioning of institutions to meet these two ends inside. So it's ultimately a social and political question as opposed to a technological question. And I think it's important that as we move forward, we remind ourselves that um, you know, these, these goals that are being launched are really focusing on those huge social aspects and the kinds of functioning institutions that need to take that forward. Now, I just want to quickly remind ourselves, I think, in looking at the Sustainable Development Goals, it's based on our three fundamental principles. Now, those principles, one, transformative, that it's addressed to address systemic drivers, barriers, ensure equity, and build resilience. It's about universality, leaving no one behind, making sure that the actors around the table are all inclusive from the ground up. Uh, uh, should be included. The Millennium Development uh, uh, Goals and the processes were critiqued, were criticized because of a lack of inclusiveness, sufficient inclusiveness from the ground. It's about integration, looking at the social, economic, and environmental uh, dimensions, and really, you know, um, uh, making sure we are enabling uh, those linkages. So it is really, as I said, about achieving a good balance between improving human well-being and sustainably managing the natural resource base. How do we reconcile the imbalance in the relationship between production and consumption within countries, between countries and between regions? It is ultimately about those values that undergird the economic arrangements in our societies and the ecological environment and are the future we want. So the question is, what is the future we want? That's the question. And, um, we cannot divorce the, qu the answer to the question I've just posed from the historical trajectory of agricultural revolutions. We know that the conventional science that informed agriculture over the last uh, 100 years have been phenomenally successful, starting from the European agricultural indo industrialization to the uh, uh, agricultural industrialization in North America, starting from the Midwest, the Corn Belt, moving to the Carolinas, moving to the, to the Pacific, hugely successful. More recent years, we're looking at the green revolutions of Asia, looking at the green revolutions of Latin America, hugely successful. But we are recognizing that, um, and I think there's increasing awareness that there are limits, indeed, to um, those green revolutions. So the question is, what's the future we want? What's the future we fear? I think um, yesterday it was interesting, uh, John's presentation, John McDermott, very interesting presentation where he gave the example of India and talked about caloric intake, about nutrition, and talked about diabetes. So we have to look at what are the limits to the kinds of agricultural systems that have really driven tremendous success in providing quantity and how that relates to the future we want. We had Christelle who gave the presentation on, on uh, livestock and talked about confinement systems and the whole um, notion of phosphorus in the soil and the kinds of interesting negative unintended consequences on soils, on, on pastures and therefore on animal welfare. So, you know, hugely important questions and, and so we want uh, the kind of science that is so, so the, the SDGs that we are all, we've all been reflecting on over the last you know, a day or two have really, really focused on that future uh, we want and the kind of science that is needed to drive you know, innovations and actions towards that future. So is it time 
perhaps for a broader and more complex science at the nexus of people, economy, environment, um, that deal with the many interlinked sustainable development goals of poverty reduction, food and nutrition security, with sustainable natural resources management, but also um, along with the very difficult cross-cutting uh, issues of gender, youth, and broader social inclusion. Is that so? So it's it's a challenge we have, and it's the there is a tremendous opportunity for science to really position and to play continue to play important roles. So the question is, what kind of science are we looking at? The normal science that focuses that makes objective assumptions about the world with, within which the science can um, translate. I have taken a few minutes to just you know kind of provide a framing background to uh, this whole question of science in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals. As I indicated earlier on in my opening talk, that we spent a whole week in Indonesia, uh, six regions in the world, uh, in the developing world, where agroforestry scientists work and are uh, made to look at, is our science still relevant in dealing with this complexity of uh, this thing that is called the Sustainable Development Goals? And I just want to take, to segue, uh, uh, now to just sharing with you a summary of some of the interesting insights that emerged from that discussion around the role of science in, in relation to the accomplishment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, uh, it was interesting to me the number of times I had very, you know, folks stop, stop by and ask me what, what agroforestry is. Uh, they're very little. Uh, uh, it's surprising, not, not too much uh, um, uh, awareness and knowledge there about this thing called um, agroforestry because it's a relatively uh, different uh, new science in the, in the scheme of things. But uh, agroforestry is, is an integrated land use management system that incorporates trees on farms with livestock. It's characterized by multifunctionality and the diversity of production landscapes. And we look, and landscapes are looked at from at nested levels, from the plot to the farm, uh, from the plot to the farm, and you know, uh, lands. It's inherently interdisciplinary. Um, it recognizes the intrinsic connections between the socio-ecological uh, different systems. So tree-based production landscapes, they're very complex adaptive systems that cannot be fully understood through just the mere application of our normal science. And when I talk about normal science, it's the science we're all socializing as, um, as uh, researchers. Um, we're, uh, we're trained to uh, uh, understand and accept that there is an objective reality out there, and we can actually take parts of it, control that, understand it, and apply it across you know, the knowledge that is generated from that a context across space and time, um, that it is actually separate from the messy, contested, and political context in which it is applied. But agroforestry science positions itself at that intersection that of the social world and the objective world, because that's really what reflects the reality in the world. Uh, 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 if we're dealing with, dealing, dealing with complex change on the ground, the argument of you know, agroforestry as a science is that it has to be flexible enough, nimble enough, and question some of those boundaries of the kinds of normal science that we've all been trained with. So it's all about interactions. It's a systems orientation, looking at all these interactions in agricultural production landscapes, in which trees are a key part of um, that production landscape. It is about you know, investigating the nutrient, carrying out investigations into nutrient cycling among trees, uh, animals, and crops. It is about exploring local ecological knowledge. We talked about indigenous knowledge um, uh, uh, in, in the talk that uh, Costas just gave. It is about local economical knowledge and, and, how, and that, how that informs the development of improved uh, agricultural production uh, management practices. It is about looking at expanding tree species diversity and developing coping mechanisms to, to climate change vulnerability. It is about enhancing water efficiency uh, by trees and agroforestry systems. It's about looking at tree crop interactions, a hugely systems-oriented approach to science that deals with the complexity and the suboptimality of uh, production systems. Uh, really important to recognize that. But I just want to also quickly just 
you know, I have a friend, a colleague, uh, Miner, and I, uh, unfortunately he is, is, is credited here for this slide, who looks at agroforestry in many parts of the developing world in Asia. You have hugely forested landscapes still, but at that interface between agriculture and, um, and, agri and, and forests are where you can have, you know, they're connected through intermediary land use, jointly providing these four critical functions that are reflected in the four key sustainable development goals that are in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sustainable development goals that we laid out. Rural incomes, food production, nutrition and health, natural resource management. And you find in places in regions such as in Sub-Saharan Africa where less forested, but you have clearly huge uh, relationships between the agricultural uh, space, landscape, and the agroforestry landscapes. It's, it's, it facilitates and supports intensive agroforestry and agricultural landscapes to continue to provide those functions. That's where we talk about sustainable intensification or ecological intensification. So I better, yeah, yeah, intensification. So um, hugely important. I just wanted to flag that um, again. But it is about um, looking at jamplazing improvement and looking at it from the standpoint of Jamplazing improvement for products, food, medicine, income. Jamplazing improvement for services, providing tremendously important ecological, uh, environmental um, uh, services, uh, contributing to clean water, health, and so on. So looking at genetics, not necessarily from the standpoint of particular commodity crops, but looking at it from a more systems-oriented uh, uh, perspective. Um, and diversity, um, nutrition diversity is hugely important in, in, in breeding work it being in the context of, of agroforestry where dietary diversity, nutrition diversity, hugely important. So uh, 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 you mentioned uh, uh, often crops. Uh, those are huge areas, missed opportunities in breeding programs. And so the question is, what opportunities exist to inform or guide sustainable development goals from that broader context? Um, uh, uh, I can t give the example of the, the baobab tree. We call the baobab tree the, the nutrient bomb of the world because that's a tree that has 10 times the micronutrient uh, 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 component than perhaps you'll find in, 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 in uh, spinach uh, and so many other attributes. But is it on the agenda for uh, plant breeding uh, in, in agriculture. Perhaps these are questions that need to be addressed as we look at uh, sustainable development goals and the role of science. It is about researching and developing strategies for prevention and rehabilitation of degraded lands at different landscape scales. It is about learning, on ha learning how to sustainably manage our landscapes and developing land health surveillance tools for decision analysis and so on. Um, agroforestry is uh, uh, climate smart agriculture, new terminology, but it's the kind of research that has continually been done within the agroforestry community that looks at increasing sustainable productivity, strengthening farmers' resilience to climate change, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration, generating innovations and technologies that address these. But it is also not just about technologies, it's about looking at institutions. It's about looking at the, the social context within which technological innovations play out. So looking at issues of tenure and rights and governance, um, really hugely important uh, in this whole discussion around sustainable development goals. Functioning institutions, uh, advocating, uh, informing policy processes. I'm kind of quickly running through this now because I know uh, my time is almost up, but it is also about, because at the end of the day, whenever you put in these social issues, these institutional dimensions, it's ultimately a negotiation among multiple actors with interests that, are, that can be contested and are, are conflicting. So it is about you know, uh, um, these kinds of negotiations. So the kinds of tools, robust tools, that inform and guide that process of decision making uh, or for the use of sustainable landscapes that can enhance livelihoods, enhance economic growth, and maintain ecosystem services. But in the final slide I have, and this is my last but one slide, it is about the huge elephant in the room, and it is about social equity and social inclusion. This is the cross-cutting challenge. For decades, we've talked about gender, we've heard a lot about it, but the extent to which there, this continues to be a pernicious problem across the technology community and the science community is huge. Stark gender differences in economic opportunities and access to and control over land, access to information, the fact that um, 
women, smallholders, rural communities in developing countries tend to always have to have women who, the, the women are part of the community, always less educated, less literate, less access to resources. They tend to cluster in marginal environments that are more vulnerable to climate variability. So these are all the evidence is there, the, the facts are out. Um, and it's also about functioning and democratic local institutions that are key to expanding the space for women and youth to participate in land use decision making. I want to make this final point on young people. In all their diversity, they make up almost half of the world's population. We have the statistics with 1.8 billion youth between the ages of 15 and 24, and over half of the world under 30 years of age. Yet, if you look at the discourse, the engagements around these pernicious problems on sustainable development, they're never there. They are not included. And I would argue that um, it's a huge risk to peace and security in the world. There is no sustainability without peace. I, 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 I will submit. And I want to leave this slide here. I'm not going to talk about it, but this is the final slide in the sustainable development goals. 16 goals and 17 that is de defined as the means of implementation. Because we talk about the technology, we talk about what science is needed, how to generate the kinds of technologies, the innovations that will drive change for sustainability. We have not talked about the vehicle the mechanism that will drive innovations to impact at scale. And I will leave this because it's all about how the cross-cutting dimensions that deal with partnerships, capacity development, extension, rural advisory services, the policy and impact learning, and gender and inclusion come together to form a dynamic platform that drive technological innovations. Very important. I would like for us to reflect on that, and I hope that will take the conversation forward in our, um, in our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Uh, that was really excellent. One, one thing that always surprises me, and I'm very naive here now, but I've heard people from eCraft speaking before and, and you know, very passionate about agroforestry and the way it can really change things. Yes. But still, you know, it, there appears to be a lot of people to yet be convinced. Uh, are, are the barriers more, you know, the, more, the need for more research or are the barriers primarily political uh, or even cultural, or what are the barriers for that you have identified as an organization mm. to reach out with the knowledge and really get transformative mm. change? Yeah. Well, I, I, would, I, I see it less as a barrier than as perhaps a challenge of communication. Um, I always mention to my colleagues when I talk about agroforestry that it is a science whose time has arrived. It's a relatively recent science in the scheme of things. And there's a lot of opportunity, there's still a lot of space for engaging and understanding and communicating the essence of agroforestry. Mm. The science we've all been socializing is a Cartesian science that does not recognize the intersections between the social world and the objective world. Mm. It's a new way of looking at knowledge and generating knowledge in service to, to solving problems on the ground. So it's not a barrier, it's more of a question of, no, of lack of awareness, a lack of understanding of this relatively new science, and lack of communicating the very essence, what it can bring to, it does not challenge our science. What it does is challenge us as scientists to expand the boundaries mm. of knowledge, to appreciate the complexity of the world in which we want to make change. So that's for me, is the fundamental challenge. It's but, about but, communication. But where you have succeeded, I mean, you, you have good examples where you mm -hmm. actually have succeeded to, yes. to achieve change. And, yeah. and w what have been the success factors in that? I mean, we heard before, for instance, the, 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 the need to, for instance, integrate farmers into mm -hmm. the discussion early mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Is that one requirement, or what, what is the success factors when mm -hmm. you really succeed to get mm -hmm. these kind of changes that mm -hmm. you're talking mm -hmm. about? Well, I would like to use um, the, you know, it's, it's amazing the extent to which success is something that can actually be, be empirically demonstrated and quantified, mm. especially in the Southeast Asia region, where ECRAF has had a, a much longer history of engagement and a much longer history of working with communities, looking at agricultural production systems where trees are part of that functioning landscape. Mm. Hugely important to the extent that today in Indonesia and many of the Latin America, of the uh, Asian countries, the policies are being influenced by mm. the technologies, by the, mo by the tools, um, and the knowledge that's mm. been generated from agroforestry. But as I indicated earlier on, we have not, I don't believe as a community of scientists, there's much has been done to really move mm. the 
results of agroforestry science and the results of research beyond just the high impact factor mm -hmm. journals to mm -hmm. engage a wider community of stakeholders to understand exactly what uh, agroforestry as a science brings to the table. Mm, that's great. And just very, you know, almost like a yes or no. We have the SDGs on Sunday night, mm -hmm. hopefully, while well we should. Um, do you think that they will help agroforestry? I mean, is, it, is this a good policy framework that actually supports the work that you are doing in a, in a positive sense? It creates a huge opportunity. Okay. It's an opportunity that, that not, not, must not be missed. And again, it is not necessarily a questioning of science, no. but a challenging of the boundaries of science and saying, you know. So this is the sustainable development, goes as I initially mentioned. It is not just about technology. It's about equity across the board, it's how the, yeah, the results of our exploitation of natural resources in pursuit of human well-being are really pursued. Mm. So Excellent. hopefully, yeah. So any quick reactions or questions uh, for, uh, for Margaret as well? Uh, come on. Yes. Well, it's good actually because we, I think it's maybe on web or, yeah, exactly, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was wondering... Say who you are also. Sir. Oh, yeah, uh, Mark, I'm uh, from Canada. Uh, I was wondering, how can you uh, ensure uh, like diversity in agroforestry? Because I guess that everybody wants to plant uh, like trees mm. that are more profitable. So how can you uh, ensure like a diversity? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting question, and it brings me to perhaps a point I did not flag. In a, you know, didn't have time because I was racing through my <laughs> slides to make sure I get to all the slides before the, my time was up. But you ask a fundamental question about context, because in the, the, uh, the system, the production systems are not uniform. They are not um, systems that are uniform across place and time. That's why we talk about agroecological context. It is about options by context. And that's a huge, in fact, an increasingly interesting uh, a kind of theory or notion of how to do research on the ground with stakeholders that uh, colleagues at the World Agroforestry Center have been really taking forward, where they're looking at how do you explore what are the options that are fit for particular contexts over time. So that is where the question on diversity, uh, I think, can be answered because each context is different mm. and each there's going to be a portfolio of options that will feel what fit one context and may not fit the other mm -hmm. context. It could be agroecological, it could be social, it could be cultural. Because you're mm -hmm. looking at different categories and types of stakeholders, women farmers, small farmers, ethnicities, marginal, marginalized, uh, what we call indigenous communities in different parts of the world. But yes, um, context does matter. But in a way, just to expand very briefly on that, I mean, in one s single context, you may still end up with a very sort of a simple setup of, of trees, for instance. I mean, you have different different parts, but mm -hmm. the diversity, the natural diversity, yeah. can, you, can you really uh, match that? Yeah, well, it's an interesting question, and that's, uh, there's a growing community of interest in agroforestry in the organization that are taking something called the con options by context approach, mm. which is a, an approach to understanding how, partic how different tree species fit in different di in, in diverse ecological contexts okay. and really trying to see how which context fits which uh, functional characteristics of particular species mm. it's it's a whole new interesting thrust in the in in, in the research uh, in the agroforestry systems uh, science domain um, so that it's a new frontier it's an interesting frontier and it is being taken forward to really understand this whole question of what three species fit which context mm. and, and and what its limits are and maybe the dynamics between them as well yeah so please hello my name is Johannes and I'm uh, doing the agroecology program on SLU um, I have a question about implementing agroforestry systems, because usually those systems take many years yes. until farmers will get profits uh -huh. yeah. or benefits. Mm -hmm. How do you tackle that in practice? Mm -hmm. How do you try to convince farmers or yeah. how can you, yeah. Yeah. what are your methods or ideas on that? That's a hugely important question mm. and it's always been the, the, the one challenge that has dogged the heels of uh, those who are showing an interest in uh, multifunctional landscapes and looking at uh, complex agricultural systems in which trees are a key part. They said the, the investment in trees, it takes a long mm. time to pay off. How do you uh, uh, stimulate uh, 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 farmers to take up those innovations that have the long-term view? 
And the argument that has been made has to do a lot with it is not an isolated trees in production systems mean that you do have agricultural production activities around trees. Whereas trees play a long-term potential you know, uh, benefit in terms of increasing incomes. Mm -hmm. Uh, during the investment in tree species, there is the case to be made that there are these other ecological benefits that come from trees in those production systems that will be generating incomes whilst the farmers ah. uh, 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 see, you know, see the, the, the long-term benefits of, of, tree, of incomes from fruit trees or incomes from uh, uh, trees. But it's interesting, it's really, you have to have both it's short a huge term challenge, and long term. Yes. Yeah. So it's a very it's good, always very been good the challenge, balancing the, the, uh, uh, the short term uh, investment, but the long term gains uh, in, in incorporating trees in production landscapes. Thank you, and two very good questions. So thank you very much, uh, Margaret, really. Yeah. Thank you.